So, Steve, um, awesome talk yesterday. Thank you. Um, so how long did you do in the DEA? 26 years. 26 years. Yeah. Cop for 38. And there might be a Netflix show that <laughs> portrays you, for yeah. those of you who don't know. There might be. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Narcos is, Narcos, well, I guess it was just one season, right? Or that one? was, well, about they, the they Escobar did a season was two seasons. Two seasons. That was about your portion of, small yeah. portion of your career. My, part, my partner, Javier, and I, it's just covers, it kind of shows me coming from Miami to Bogota mm -hmm. in 91, and then uh, kind of goes into the death of Pablo at the end of season two. Season three shows Javier going back against the Cali cartel. Yeah. Um, Obviously, it's not all true. <laughs> Just going to put that out there. I got to tell you, Hollywood doesn't let the truth get in the way of telling a good story. Yeah. <laughs> so is it more exciting or just less exciting? Than... Um, you know, the, the violence is, they, cap they did a pretty good job capturing some of the violence. Not all of it, though. No, the reality is it was much worse and it how, was continuous. How many people did, uh, did he kill? You know... We, when I say we, I'm talking about Javier, my partner. Yeah. Uh, we attributed 10 to 15, maybe 20,000 deaths. His last remaining Sicario, who passed away a few years ago, went by the moniker of Popeye. He's on a, on a documentary that we on, we're on. He says, those gringos, they got the numbers all wrong. He said, it's more than 50,000 people that Pablo's responsible for murdering. 50,000. I mean, it's... There are dictators around the world that have that killed people that haven't killed that many people. It's a mass murder. Absolutely. The, from the time that he escaped from his prison in June of 92 until he died in December 93, 143 Colombian National Police officers were killed in 18 months in one case, in the manhunt for Pablo Escobar. How long were you on that case? Uh, from the time I got in Colombia in June 91 until I left in June 94. So that, that time period when he escaped from his prison the next day. <coughs> so that was real. Oh, that portion was real. Absolutely. They, the next day, the Columbia National Police asked for Javier and I to move from Bogota to Medellin. And for the next 18 months, we lived with the Columbia National Police, lived in their compound, went on operations every day. Um, so for, for us, you know, from my background, like we leave our families and basically go to war. Mm -hmm. You brought your families with you. Brought my wife. We couldn't, yeah. we couldn't bring kids. My two sons are from my first marriage, so they stayed back in the States. So at that time, you already, had, you already had kids? Yeah. Okay. But then before we left, we adopted our two daughters. I, know, like I can't like wrap my head around. <laughs> That's the like, reason I don't have hair now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little boys are different than little girls. I can't wrap my head around doing that job and how dangerous... I mean, I don't know. How dangerous do you feel like it was day-to-day -day life just living there? Because, I mean, it wasn't a secret. They knew who you were, right? Right. right. So... I mean, you can see me. I'm I'm from English Irish heritage. I'm about as white as you get. I want to show that. I want to show the photo of when when Pablo was dead and you're wearing a red shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all days to wear a red shirt. Yeah, right? yeah. But uh, I don't. You know, I just I don't blend into a Latino country, a Hispanic country. So I stuck out. I'm six two. Uh, I'm taller than most Colombians. You know, you go out on operations. We were not allowed to wear clothing that looked like military police. Mm -hmm. So we wore jeans and polo shirts and tennis shoes. And then they would only let us carry our nine millimeters. So you're going in on the Huey gunships, you're getting shot at as you're coming in. You're trying to come into a hot LZ, you know, and, and everybody around you has got a Galil 7.62, or they got Uzis, or they got even a Ruger submachine gun. I didn't even know Ruger had a machine gun back then. They're loaded for bear, and I'm looking at mine like, what am I going to do with this? You know, I'm like, <laughs> pew, pew, pew. <laughs> balls, man. You guys had balls. Well, thank you for saying that. The way I view it is that DEA did not hire me because I'm real smart. <laughs> you know? You're going to do this job with not much, and you need to do it really well. But, but you know, and you and your listeners know, if you've ever been in that zone, the excitement, there's nothing that matches it. Yeah, so that's what's weird is during that time, and you probably felt some of this similar, it's like you have this this inflated ego of like, I'm untouchable. Sometimes. If you're hundred percent not. Ridiculous. This is ridiculous. <laughs> but you're like, nothing's gonna happen to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm invincible. But, but the reality is that. But so back to your family, like how difficult was that mentally for you 
having your wife there and eventually having your daughter there before you left? Like well, while, while, while the, the intensity of it was going on. So my wife, Connie, she's, uh, she's got bigger balls than I ever thought about having. It has, I mean, has, to, has to be. When I first met her, I used to ride motorcycles as a young man. When I first met her, she owned her own motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you not fall in love with a woman that owns her own motorcycle, right? And she's not a biker chick. She had a little Honda, you know, but that was the initial traction because she's got that adventuresome side. Yeah. So when I applied for DEA, she was on board 100%. We're, we're small town country people. Our first post was Miami, Florida in 1987. Still the Wild West down there. Yeah. She's a nurse. She went in and got a job in, you know, in, a, in a cardiac catheterization unit in Plantation, Florida, which I think is just gross. I mean, she just loves the blood and the guts and the ICUs and the CCUs and trauma. And uh, I thought it was crazy. But so we were there for three years. And my wife's always been the kind that if you and I are partners, you're family. And if you're single, she'll take care of you like a brother. I mean, my partner down there, Kevin, got shot in 1989. We got a little firefight. And the informant called a 357 round right there in the Adam's Apple. He never made it to the trauma center. But through all that excitement, you know, um, I called her. I said, hey, just letting you know, I'm okay. Kevin got shot today, but he's going to be okay. And just, you know, notifying her. And it wasn't any time she's down there visiting Kevin because he's family. Yeah. So after about three years, she said, you know what? It's been really exciting living down here. <laughs> What's the next most exciting thing we could do? I said, well, we can, I've been working some cases with the guys down in Columbia. We could move to Columbia. Well, that time I got to look like, are you freaking, I know you're stupid, but are you crazy? You know, and, and so my wife is the kind that if you tell her what to do, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You just let her think about it. So she came back in like two or three weeks and she said, were you serious? I said, absolutely. I mean, it's, I can't think of anything more exciting right now. She it's varsity. Said, let's go. I want to let's go beyond varsity. JV to varsity. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I said, uh, she said, well, if we're going to do it, let's do it while we're young. Let's go. So I put in. We were originally selected to go to Barron Kia. Um, in DEA culture, when you get a transfer like that overseas, you're expected to take your group out for the party. You sponsor your own party. Yeah. So we did that. Then I got my transfer rescinded. <laughs> but then I got Bogota. Now, you know, I give all, all the praise and glory to God for this, for the decisions, because if I'd gone to Barron Key, I would have never worked on the Escobar case. Mm -hmm. But by going to Bogota, three days after I got to Columbia is when Pablo surrendered. It gave me an opportunity to catch up, get up to speed on, on the investigation, the organization, build the relationships, the trust and respect with the Columbia National Police, so that when Pablo did escape in, in June of 92, the Colombian police thought enough of Javier and I to ask that we be transferred up there, which means Connie's in Bogota by herself. Mm -hmm. now, I got to go to language school. My Spanish is, it's, it's much better than what you see on the show, but you can tell from my accent when I speak Spanish, it's like, hola, y'all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she didn't get to go to, to language school. But uh, this is how impressive she is. I, I mean, I love this woman to death. She would go shopping and she would buy things and then she'd take it back and change color, change size or a different style. They have their own language. Bartering. I'm like, how do you do that? You don't <laughs> yeah. speak a lick of Spanish. And here's, this is how smart she is. She would look in the Spanish English dictionary and if she was looking for shoes or a dress or whatever it was, she would learn those words. And then when she would go in the stores, she'd go with a smile on her face and she tried to get along in their culture. She'd use what Spanish she could. Um, she was willing to laugh at herself. And what we found with, you know, I mean, the only Colombians I ever knew was ones I put in jail in South Florida. So what we found is a completely different culture. Yeah. The, the country of Colombia is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places on the earth. The people are very accepting as long as you try to get along in their culture. Yeah. If you act like the ugly American, they'll treat you like the ugly American. They'll tell you where the airport is. Get your butt on down to the airport, you know. But, I mean, this woman just, she would go shop. She would walk down to the mall. Uh, when I was with her, you may have experienced this in foreign countries. I'm very light skinned, got light colored eyes. I did have light colored hair and I'm 6'2". And when we go through walking through a mall, older people would just stop and stare at me. And I'm thinking, is my zipper open? You know, I had something on my nose or <laughs> something in my teeth. But they just never seen a gringo. Mm -hmm. She has a little bit of Indian blood in her. So her skin is just a tad darker than mine. And she blended right in. So, um, you know, I said this last night when we were talking here. Uh, this May will be our 40th anniversary. Congratulations. So Amazing. That woman puts up with a lot. <laughs> we have, so there was not really a, a, a threat. Just They knew who you were, so they weren't really 
was it off limits or like they just wasn't a really a threat for families? Well, um, one thing I can tell y'all last night is that Pablo put a three hundred thousand dollar price tag. He put a bounty on Javier and I, three hundred thousand each. I figured. Um, we heard and I might have been a little offended that it was so light. <laughs> Yeah. Well, today's dollars, that's, you know, that's a couple million dollars yeah. now, so you, know, you got to look down the road. Right? Yeah. But um, on some of the wiretaps, especially after we'd been in Medellin for a while, we would listen to his conversations. You know, the phones he was using was radio telephone, so mm -hmm. we brought in special operators. We brought in, um, CIA was there with us, um, no such agency might have been there with us. Mm -hmm. but anyway, we're listening. One time we heard him refer to the two gringos at the base. I mean, we had we had special operators. We had Delta and SEAL Team Six with us, studs. But um, the next phone call, he made reference to Pinion Murphy. I can tell you, it's when they first tell you there's a bounty on you, it's a little di disconcerting. But after a couple of days, it's like, yeah, I got a bounty on me. I'm a tough guy. <laughs> well, and you know, you've got you you're making enough. Yeah, you're getting under his skin. You're getting under his skin that he's willing to spend money to get that, remove that needle. But then yeah. when when you hear him say your name, I mean, this isn't like that TV show Cheers where you want everybody to know your no. name. <laughs> yeah. That was... Uh, One of the most evil people in the world at the time. <sighs> yeah. But, and here's, you know, people say, well, how did we survive? Because, you know, I pretend to be a tough guy. I've never been a tough guy. I'm just a small town country boy. Um I give all the credit to God for keeping me alive down there because I, I believe, I truly believe that God has a plan for all of us. Yeah, because you guys saw, there was, you had a lot of loss down there, not just, not you guys, but the, your partner force that you were working with yep. constantly, right? I, absolutely. And then, I mean, you know, I didn't have this with me back then. And, and in DEA, you get a little extra training with weapons familiarization. Mm -hmm. And um, we worked with a, an elite group of Columbia National Police officers that would never, I mean, when the, when the bullets started flying, we knew they wouldn't run off and leave us. They'd stand there and fight. But at the same token, they knew we wouldn't run off and leave them. Yeah. We'd stand there and fight with them. So, um, and the other thing, quite honestly, is the other thing is is uh, the the history of Kiki Camarena. That was our agent in the early 80s that was mm -hmm. kidnapped, tortured, and murdered in Mexico by the cartels. And they saw the response of the United States. At that time, our government had balls. Yeah, you know, and they shut down the border with Mexico because the Mexicans wouldn't cooperate. It took yeah. two hours for them to come back to the table. Yeah. To this day, there are still fugitives in that case. The DEA still pursues, and that was in the nineteen, you know, early nineteen eighties when when Kiki was killed. But anyway, the point of that story is, if you think about these drug traffickers, they're in business to make money. It's all about building up their greed, their ego, their power base. If you shut down their business, well, they're not making any money. So it's counterproductive. And they, we believe that they believed that the response to the United States, if they hurt one of us, would be the same response. And I like to believe it would be too. Nowadays, I don't have that confidence. Well, back then. <coughs> back then it was. Yeah. Uh, although the president in that time... So here's another story. <laughs> After Pablo was dead, we're still in Bogota. And we're cleaning up loose ends and still going to Medellin. And an informant walks in. He says he's got information on the Medellin cartel. When that happens, they immediately call Javier. Right? So we both have to be in the embassy that day, and we bring him into a room. And he said, look, I, was, I worked for Pablo. He said, uh, my primary responsibility was every three weeks I'd fly to Haiti. The president of Haiti at the time was Jean-Bertrand Aristide. He said, uh, my job, I carried a suitcase with $400,000 every three weeks, and I paid off Aristide. Well, what would you get in exchange for that? We were allowed to bring our drug planes in and use military airstrips in Haiti without being accosted. We'd store the cocaine there, then we'd put it on either coastal freighters or go-fast boats and take it to South Florida. So when you accuse a president of another country, even Haiti, you know, a lot of red flags go up. So this guy, we brought our polygraphers down and talked to him. And, and when, you're, when you're dealing with somebody th like that, the first thing you need to determine is what is their motivation? What is it you want out of this? Why are you giving Why us are you this telling information? Me this, this yeah. This juicy bit of information. Exactly. He said, he said hey, I'm, I've become a Christian since Pablo died, and I feel like I need to atone for my sins, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, well, that's a legitimate. I mean, you still got to corroborate things, but yeah. you know, at least you're on the road. So uh, we brought our polygraphers in. They boxed him, passed twice. So the, the CIA brings their polygraphers in twice. Now, the, the agency, you know, they have their snitches, spies, informants, whatever you want to call them. 
And so what they wanted to know from this young man was, what room did you, what building did you go to when you met the president? Because it was always the same place. Mm -hmm. So he told them, they said, what room did you go to in that building? He told them. They said, okay, what the, what the furniture look like in there? <coughs> the conference room. So he described that. They said, what pictures are on the wall? He told them what pictures. Everything was 100% accurate. So now, as my wife and I are transferring, we're PCSing back to the United States. In June of 94, we've got our two daughters who are babies. They put the informant on the plane with us from Bogota to Miami, and then my old enforcement group came out, and they whisked him away to a safe house. But they were going to indict Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Well, there was a president in, in power during that time that we sometimes refer to as Slick Willie, mm -hmm. who sent word down that we were not going to indict anybody. And then, lo and behold, who do we give asylum to in the United States? Jean Bertrand Aristide. And then who do we reinstall as the president of Haiti? The same guy. I have met SEALs, Dev Group guys now, that tell us the story that they were on the crew that reinstalled Jean Bertrand Aristide in the country of Haiti as their president. And if you look at the Clinton Foundation, it's the Haitian Foundation. Uh, so is there a conspiracy there? You make the determination. But to me, as a trained criminal investigator, where there's smoke, there's fire. Damn. Damn. So, what a great what a what a great place to be to be on both sides of being protected from both sides, of the, getting paid by the criminals and being protected by politicians. That's politics just kill you. I mean, just I don't know how you did that job for so long. I can, I'll tell you one more quick story. I don't want to take up your time, but... Uh, no, I love it. When I first got on DEA, and I mentioned this uh, in my talk last mm -hmm. night, I've been a cop for 12 years when I came to DEA. Most powder cocaine I'd ever seen was two ounces, a baggie about that size. First undercover trip, I got to go You were on. a cop with the DEA or... or I was before DEA. Where, who were you a, with? I was a cop in a small town in West Virginia. Okay. And I was a railroad cop in Virginia. So I come to DEA. The first undercover trip I get to go on is to the Turks and Caicos Islands, which I never even heard of. <laughs> so you're like, holy shit. <laughs> I don't even know there's an island down there. Yeah. And we go on a 53-foot Hatteras Sport Fisherman, which I know what a John boat is with a paddle. Yeah. Because that's river fishing, right? Yeah. Um, and we go down and make a really long story short, a twin-engine plane flies in from Cuba, goes to the end of runway in Providencial. So we're down there undercover. We got Provo cops with us. Plane, the door opens, they threw out all these green duffel bags, 400 kilos of cocaine. So I went from two ounces to 880 pounds of coke. And I, like I said last night, yeah. I was addicted to cocaine at that point, just in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> but in that case, uh, and I'm just, I'm the new guy, and I'm working with a senior partner, and he's been working this case for a couple years. The, the point was, we had a AWACS radar plane up. So they tracked that twin engine coming out of Cuba, and when it left, it refueled and went back. It went back into Cuba. And so that was the evidence that was going to be used. to. Where yours is? This was 1988. Okay. They, my partner, Gene, we call him Gino, Gene Frankar. Gene was going to indict Raul Castro, Fidel's brother. And that was the first time I saw where a phone call comes down from the White House through the chain of command. You're not indicting anybody. And in our book, uh, Manhunters, we had a ghostwriter because you know, when I write, it sounds like, you know, it looks like right, third grade writing. <laughs> um, uh, Isabel Vincent, and she's an excellent researcher. She's an uh, investigative reporter for the New York Post, still is to this day. And she was able to go back and find documentation because eventually that was leaked out somewhere. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you that, it wasn't me. I don't know where the leak came from, but uh, she found, she documented that uh, the Castros came out and said, oh, we heard about that and we did our own investigation. You know what? We identified four of our generals that were conspir conspiring to do that with cocaine. So you know what we did with them? We shot them all before they could talk to anybody. Talk about scapegoat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're paying the ultimate price just to save face for the Castro brothers. It's, it's the, the politics, I get, in a single word, it just sucks. Wow. What are you doing now? We have our weekly true crime podcast, Game of Crimes. We have a guest on every show, which uh, we, you may be seeing yourself on there in the not too distant future here. Uh, we're doing the Lost Clipper Project uh, over in Micronesia. We're going back there on April 2nd for a couple weeks to search. Um, our book's out, Manhunters, Tells a True Story, Pablo Escobar. There's a variety of nonprofits that we support, Southern California Game Conference, the Orlando Police Foundation, the DEA Educational Foundation now, 
uh, Sid Gordon and, and Mel Chancey's uh, Military Appreciation Weekends. This, mm -hmm. is, this has been a blast. I was going to say, I was like, what did you think of the weekend so far? I haven't had this much fun in a long time. It's a good group of guys, right? Oh, my gosh. I try to tell, I try to tell people like the, that it come aboard Corps. I'm like, it, it's, a, it's different than any other clinic or any other medical clinic for hormone replacement therapy. It's just a... I know it's, it sounds cliche to say like it's kind of like a family, but it really is. Once you get in, you communicate with these people, yeah. and you build rapport with them. It's, um, it's a gr really, really good group of guys. I didn't even know what it was. I mean, I met Sid last year in San Diego at the Southern California Game Conference, and uh, just kind of hit it off, and I went and had dinner with him one evening, and the next thing you know, here I am. Yeah. And I really debated whether I wanted to come to this because I didn't know what it was about. Oh, I, you I really missed. didn't know what core medical group was. You would have missed out. Oh yeah, and Lou Velozzi, one of my brothers, you know, brothers in arms. That uh, he he's calling like Murphy, you got to go, you got to go, you just come up. And try How long have you known Lou? Um, he was the fourth person we had on our podcast. Okay. Three years ago. Okay. But he had me on his podcast. He had Javier and I on his podcast. He used to have a podcast that was called End of Watch. Yeah, I, I was on it. With oh him, yeah, with Bootsy. Yeah, with yeah, Kevin yeah. Rogan. Yeah. yeah. So that's where I first met him, and. His personality, he loved the guy. Yeah, I know. I, know. I mean, he's, he's a monster, but, and, and his wife, Claire, and, and, you know, they brought some of their friends here, the Howard family. Mm -hmm. I got here the first night. Lou wasn't here. I really, I, you know, I know Sid, but he's busy. I really didn't know too many people here, and the Howards just kind of, hey, come sit with us. And, and they're best friends with uh, Lou and his family, and, and now, I mean, that's a family. I've known him for three days now. I invite him to come stay at our house when yeah. we come to Orlando. Just Met so many fantastic people here, the heroes that are here, the not only the military, but the first responders. There's law enforcement here, there's firemen here, there's EMTs here. Uh, a lot of, I felt like I was in a very like-minded community. You are. And last night, given my little talk, I've never done my life. You know, we usually get up and tell a true story, Pablo. I can do that in my sleep. Mm -hmm. we've, we've done it hundreds of times. And I can get, we sold out the Sydney Opera House in Australia. I mean, mm -hmm. we've yeah. talked to big audiences and I'm comfortable doing that. Last night, I was, I can't remember the last time I was that nervous, but I think it was, I was concerned that I might uh, disrespect or disappoint the no, people that were there. Not even close. Because these are, I mean, these are heroes. You know, these are, these are true heroes. It's not people that show up to a soccer game and get a damn trophy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. These are the people who have put their lives on the line. Sacrificed some stuff. And didn't ask for anything in return. Yeah aren't even asking for respect, and they, you know, you, I say they, you guys deserve all the respect in the world for what you did. I appreciate that. Well, it's an amazing story. So I'd love to have you up and do actually, actually a long one and actually break, break some stuff down and get, in, get into the politics of things um, and where you see things going now, but we can do that at the table. Yeah, be glad know, to, and com man. And comfy. Um, to. So where can people find you? Uh, check out deanarcos.com, D-E-A-N-A-R-C-O-S.com. Okay. Uh, check out our podcast, gameofcrimespodcast.com. And then the uh, Operation Lost Clipper, that's lostclipper.com. Excellent. <laughs> Slot.com uh -huh. is in there. Go check it out. Links are below. Uh, sir, thank you so much. Brother, thank you for having yeah, me on the show. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Yeah.